Tucker Max is a multiple-time New York Times best-selling author. He's undergone a radical personal transformation from selfish playboy to dedicated father, business leader, and now rancher as a result of therapy and psychedelics. We chat about how someone can know what healing mode is best for them and the biggest lessons that he's taken from his transformation. Thank you for making it out, man. Of course. Yeah, Wonderful. My to have pleasure. You. Yeah. So I just was mentioning to you, I, I want to do a you've had a important intervention points in my life. We we're mm-hmm. just recounting them. I yeah. don't know if you know them all. The first one was on your message board. Yeah. I found a post of guys like I found a secret technology that is too powerful for anyone. Right. It is, it's a book called The Game. <laughs> I did not write that. I know you didn't write it. But I when I encountered that, that was my beginning of what became a self-improvement journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, second was uh, in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Reached out to you on Clarity. Right. You gave yeah. me some tough love. Yeah. Told me that we look like douchebags on the thing. Yeah. At you- that point, you did. You, did. <laughs> you were right. So we had a- We all do at some point. That's okay. There's no problem. 25 years old. We were called Kick-Ass Academy. And you're like, dude, this is for- This is douchebags. Yeah. 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 Right. Which is, we all go through that phase. It's no problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was that we changed our name after that, changed our marketing, and the business right. like tripled. And What'd you change the, it to? To Charisma on Command. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that did really well. It's, yeah. Charisma it's, on Command is a good name. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that was that was a pivotal change point. And then one of the other ones was, uh, I'd done ayahuasca, but then I encountered your piece on MDMA psychedelics. Mm-hmm. And that, God, if I'd encountered that prior to Very ayahuasca. Very different medicines. Oh my God. God, yeah. dude, I wish I'd done MDMA. Not, I don't wish, but when I, I talk I know to what people, you mean. I'm very glad I did MDMA first. Yeah. Because life would have been much harder for me had I done Aya or a Boga first. Or mm-hmm. a Bo- oh, God, if I'd done a Boga first, it would have been a world of pain. Okay, so this is, I've not done a Boga. So I was thinking that we could do something like your beginner's guide because yeah. it was tremendously impactful yeah, for me. happy to. Mm-hmm. Let's start with you. Um you're pretty hardcore whenever you do anything. Like right. you were huge into hedonism, mm-hmm. huge into yeah. psychotherapy. Yeah. How does psychedelics relate to psycho- psychotherapy? Right. So um, they're, they're all tools to um, self-improvement mm-hmm. in the broadest sense, right? Um, although I will say I don't like to use the terms – self-improvement or or things like that because those have a very western egotistical sort of intellectual uh bent to them right they're not wrong but like it's it's uh, to me it's a lot more accurate to say like uh uh self-exploration growth um things like that right but the point is they're all tools to use right like the way the way i think of it is like building a house Right, like if you're gonna build a house yourself, then you need a hammer, you need a screwdriver or an impact driver, you know, you need um, a table saw, right? And these are all important tools. Like if you're trying to build a house without an impact driver or a table saw or a bandsaw or whatever, man, it's gonna be hard, right? I guess it's possible. But uh, but even if you don't use, let's say, a table saw, you need a hand saw, right? Okay, you need tools. But uh, uh, imagine if you were really focused on the tools, right? Like, oh, man, I'm going to be a master at a table saw. Okay, that's cool, like if you're a carpenter or a woodworker. But the table saw doesn't matter. The table saw is the tool you use to build the house. The house is the goal. So uh, 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 talk therapy, psychedelics, yoga, meditation, they are all tools you use to build, discover, improve yourself, however mm-hmm. you, you want to frame it, right? And so, so, uh, and they're all useful tools, but, um, uh, and you, like, if you're going to start using a, a table saw, you need to learn that tool or you're going to lose fingers, right? Like mm-hmm. it's, it's a dangerous tool, but it's also extremely useful. So uh, I, I, if you think of them as tools to use to accomplish a goal, they're absolutely fantastic. The, the problem that I see is a lot of people get stuck in the tool, right? Mm-hmm. Like you've probably met like if someone who was obsessed with an impact driver, you'd be like, <laughs> right. Like unless you're like, unless that's your job is building impact drivers or designing them, right? Yeah. That's a job and it's an important job. But otherwise like, bro, why are you really just showing me your Milwaukee impact driver all day long? <laughs> like this is, it's cool, but like there's other shit. Right. And that's like, you know, you meet the people who are like, ayahuasca. And yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, dude, stop. I is not the, the point. The point is, what do you get out of it? How do you mm-hmm. use it? You know? Um, and so that's 
that's how I look at all of these things now is how are they tools? How they're tools, how am I going to use them, et cetera, et cetera. What's the best way to use them, all that stuff. What was the job that needed to be done for you? Did okay. you have any, of like, when you get into this, because I, what I see is that the awareness of the job that I had to be done is I had a tough breakup and I don't want to feel the sad it feeling anymore. So I'm going to be open to fucking ayahuasca, yeah. <laughs> which was, uh, I didn't know the job that needed to be yeah. done when so, I got into it. All right. That's a hard question to answer in the broad. Like I can mm -hmm. answer it for me specifically. Well, I would, I would right? love to hear for you specifically because okay. I actually think, and through your own personal story. Right. Okay. So, so let, what you just said is actually great. I, I felt very sad because of a breakup mm -hmm. and I wanted to get that sadness away. Mm -hmm. That's the way most people deal with emotion, mm -hmm. right? Is uh, I have a, a, an emotion I don't want to feel, what most people will call a negative emotion. Yeah. Grief, sadness, um, fear, whatever. I want to get it away. Uh, what I'm going to tell, and that's how almost everyone approaches life. It's how I approach life for probably about the first 40, two years. Wow. And um, it doesn't work, right? And, and uh, I don't mean you can't push emotions away. You absolutely can push emotions away for a while, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like a debt, right? Like, yeah, it works a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could not pay a debt, <laughs> yeah. right? But then eventually the debt comes due, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't pay the debts long enough, a dude with a gun is going to show up at your house, mm -hmm. whether it's a debt to the government or a debt to a bank or, you know, like, if you don't pay the bank, yeah, you know, the sheriff show up and take your shit, mm -hmm. whatever. The point is someone's showing up to get you, right? Mm -hmm. um, emotions are exactly the same, except the person showing up to get you is you. Mm. It's not not someone else. And so um, that was that that was my life, right? Like uh, like most people. So me for me specifically, uh, grew up. I had really really crappy parents, right? They, 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 they didn't sexually abuse me. They didn't beat me, but like, um, it, it, they did the thing that is, that actually in a lot of studies, whether this is true or not, it, I think it depends on the person, whatever, but, the, but there is, um, a, a line of thought and a lot of data that shows that neglect is at least as impactful as physical and sexual abuse, if not worse in a mm. lot of situations, just because the, the the way it, it it acts on a child's mind, right? Like, uh, uh, and I, my parents were extremely neglectful mm. in a white sort of upper class way, yeah. right? Like emotionally, right? I was never starving. You know, I wasn't eating out of a dumpster. It wasn't anything like that. Like you understand that those like people have those narratives, and that's horrible, right? Like that's. Um, like I had stuff and they were around, but they were never emotionally connected with me. They were not bad people. They were just horrible parents, right? When you say horrible parents, one of the things that I think is, well, was that a tricky realization for you to come to? Because I, took a long the, I, my parents were not horrible parents. They were flawed people. Right. A, and, but that, right. that breakthrough. It can have a lot of impact. It's yeah. so yeah. challenging to get to because the desire to protect, I don't think people realize how deep that loyalty runs in most children that haven't just experienced absolute. Well, that's not loyalty. What that is, your parents told you a story, consciously or uh -huh. unconsciously, that they were good parents. Yeah. Because they needed to believe yeah. that. And then you adopted that story and then defended that story in the face of all evidence. That you know, I always joke, man. My parents were they were so bad as parents. They didn't they, it was kind of a gift. Most people are like in America, most people are like you. Their parents are very flawed people, but they love them the best yeah. they can, and they do a poor job, but they do it from a position of love and caring, right? And so what those parents do is they mix love with abuse. Yeah. And that is actually, I think, the hardest thing to deal with. Is <laughs> no, really, because separating the, what's the abuse and what's yeah. the love is really hard. Yeah. My parents actually gave me a gift. Um they Clarity. <laughs> no, they hardly mixed any love with the abuse. For real. Yeah. So it was like my parents were so bad when it came time for me to really look at it. Mm. I was like, oh, man, they sucked. Mm -hmm. And like there, was, there wasn't – I knew it like 17, 18 my parents sucked. And like as parents, right? And yeah, yeah, they did the best they could and all that. But the best they could was shitty. Mm -hmm. And like – it, 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 like like laughable almost how bad they were at, at, at being parents and and how neglectful in, in all the ways that mattered 
And like, uh, you know, where I look at like my wife, my, my wife is much more s- similar to you in that like, like I, kn- I know her, you know, uh, not her, her dad. He died before I met her, but her mom. And her mom's an amazing grandmother mm-hmm. and a great woman and was very flawed as a parent. And I can still see the dynamic. My wife, you know, she's done a lot of her own work, but she's working through like how to separate all of those things, yeah. right? Because I know it's funny. My wife had a very different view of her mom until she saw what my mom was like. And then she's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize. My mom actually did a really good job she, in a lot of ways. She's pretty great. Right. Like, <laughs> like she, my wife's view of, of her mom was like all bad. And mm-hmm. then she saw my mom and she's like, okay, a lot of the stuff I thought about my mom was wrong, but it, you know, it was right. But there's a huge section of that she was great that I didn't even realize because yeah. I was putting it all together, right? And so that's a really good observation. And so- my parents were, were were really bad at being parents. I understood that intellectually pretty quickly. Um, and, and so basically my my journey has been um, a lot of people talk about maturing and they don't really know what that means. To most people, maturing means like learning to effectively follow the rules of society, mm-hmm. which is nonsense because most societal rules are are bullshit. And um, or at, at at best bullshit, at worst very counterproductive to a healthy life. Uh, for me, I feel like maturing is about um, really understanding who and what you are, what you're feeling, and then appropriately dealing with your emotions. Right? Like, so let's go back to what I was talking about about um, pushing emotion away. Everyone thinks either I need to learn to control emotion. Or get it away, Mm -hmm. right? One or the other. Neither of those work. Uh, Because uh, pushing it away, it's just going to come back. It doesn't go away. Yeah, well, I think this is where does it go. Well, quite literally, it's stored in your body. Yeah. Right? So if if that sounds kooky to you, there's a ton of of really, really good science on Science has actually stood up to replication, (laughs) like real science on this. Um, uh, the the book to start, uh, the place to start is a book called The Body Keeps a Score, written by a guy named Bessel van der Kirk. Um, and there's a bunch of other guys, uh, uh, Peter Levine and others who've done a ton of research on this. Um, the, 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 um, whatever the emotion is, let's take grief, right? Because that was a big one for me. Uh, grief quite literally stores in the body. Where it stores and how it stores... Mm, we're not really sure in a lot of ways. Like, like the researchers are not really sure, but it does. Did There's you no have doubt. like a big release of grief? Yeah. So, um, uh, that was the big thing for me was grief, mm. right? Because like I intellectually understood my parents were fucked up at 18, mm. right? And I remember like going through that and realizing, oh, they're fucked up. I'm not fucked up. Mm. Like I may be fucked up from deal from them. But, like, I'm not the one who screwed up. The things that they right. implicitly told right. me about myself are not, yeah. Right, either explicitly or implicitly. And a lot of it was explicit. Like, my, my, my dad's side were not, but my mom's, my mom and her side of the family were, like, yellers and abusers and you're mm. stupid and you're that. Well, they didn't call me stupid because that you can't call me stupid, but they call me a lot of the shit. Mm. And so, like, that stuff was, like, pretty easy to see. That was at 18, let's call it, roughly. It took me until I was 42 to start to actually, 36 to 38, to start to feel those emotions, Mm -hmm. right? Understanding your mom is messed up and didn't really want you and it has a lot of her own conflicts and all that stuff, like, is kind of, for me, it was kind of easy to do, to understand it, but I didn't feel that emotion. I thought if I understood this, oh, she's fucked up. Okay, that's it. I, there's not, and for a while, man, for ten years plus, not even, yeah, probably eight, six, seven years. That was like enough to understand. Like I let go of so much anger towards her, resentment, or frustration. She mm-hmm. was, oh, she's the problem here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what I hadn't done is felt any of the emotions, yeah. right? Like felt it for a child to not be wanted by their mom is ex- so devastating. extraordinarily devastating is the right word. And there's grief and sadness and all this shit. And I had pushed that deep mm. away, right? So so in me, like being really frank, how did that come out? I mean, listen, bro, I wasn't actually that hedonist. Like you use that word, you're not wrong. But I wasn't hedonist. I was uh, 
because uh, like I would drink a lot, but like compared to people who really drink a lot, like really not that much. Like it's so funny. Like people read my stuff and think, oh, like when I was still like kind of in that phase, this guy like party so much, and they'd come hang out with me. And they'd be like, well, you only had ten beers tonight. Mm-hmm. I'm like. Well, I don't need more. <laughs> that gets me pretty drunk yeah. and we have a great time. Why do I need to drink 30? Yeah. And like, so like, uh, uh, like hedonism, pure hedonism wasn't the thing. The, the place where I was highly indulgent was women, mm-hmm. right? Like that was the thing. And, and I especially liked, um, I mean, I like novelty. I like a lot of different women, right? At that phase of my life. And let's call it 25 to like, 30, mm. right? And, and uh, uh, I, bro, I met some amazing women in that period. Like there was a girl I dated about my last year of law school. Uh, 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 her name was Christina. And um, she's an amazing, she's uh, like, I'm not going to go into depth of what she's doing now. She's like doing amazing shit. She's this incredible woman. And it's like, it's funny. It's like I I married a woman just like her mm-hmm. like 20 years later or, or Fifteen years later, almost exact, very, very similar. Um, uh, but it took me fifteen years to meet another one. And like, uh, if I was emotionally healthy, even remotely, I mean, she, this one was stunning, beautiful. Like, I would have married that one. Yeah, like the, the, she was incredible in all ways. Um, uh, exactly what I wanted, a perfect partner for me. And. Um, uh, you can meet multiple ones, but just not a lot of, right? Mm-hmm. So I got, I've met like two, maybe three of those in my life. And I married one, thankfully, but it took me a long time to get there because at 25, I had so much unresolved emotional shit with my mom mm-hmm. that like needs maybe the wrong word. I, 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 the way I was dealing with it, instead of feeling any of those emotions, I was, I'm going to sleep with a ton of women. I'm not going to get close to any of them. I'm going to essentially, this sounds horrible, man, but this is like the really frank way to put it. I'm going to reject a ton of women so that I don't have to feel my rejection from my mom. Right? To put it really simplistically. Well, that dynamic is is super important because the feeling, I mean, I found this. If you can't feel grief, if you can't feel those things, you tend to, it's got to come out some more. Like, <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Ex- and that's such a good insight, man. You've de- clearly done some work because like that's not an yeah, insight yeah. that people have until they've done real work. And so like, and of course I didn't understand any of this. Like I wasn't trying to hurt any women. Like mm-hmm. I, the, I, I liked women. I liked being with a lot of women. That aspect was sex is fun. It's enjoyable. Me, like experiencing tons of women. There was an enjoyable part to it. But the deep emotional undercurrent that was pushing mm-hmm. that was um, the pain of rejection mm-hmm. that I had I had only intellectually realized yeah. and had not at all felt in any way, shape, or form. And those are totally different things. And anyone who tells you that they are the same, they not, they're not just foolish, but they're dangerous mm-hmm. to themselves. Mm-hmm. Right, and I was, and to others in, in, in certain ways. Yeah. Um, although emotionally dangerous, though, right. I, I'm sure but, people but were look, sad <laughs> as a result of. But the it's not like I mean, listen, I was attracting the type of women who were like looking for that, so it was mm-hmm. it was those toxic dynamics are going both ways, of course, right? And it's, it's not, not like, it's not about casting blame right, at all, right? right. There no, was, no, I mean, I was doing some fucked up <laughs> shit. Like, let's not pretend. That, <laughs> all right, we'll get my we'll right. gavel out. We'll judge you. <laughs> right. There was one thing that you said that I just wanted to highlight, which is uh, the good things. The, I asked earlier, what is the job? And like you just described, the universe put something in front of you that right. was like just good. It was it was this woman who was intelligent, smart, attractive. She right. was right in your field. Exactly who I and wanted. And you can to blow right past it. Yeah. And I think that's one of like one of the jobs is to stop overlooking all of the wonderful things that are placed in your path. Well, you know, man, like I think I think about this a lot. Like, what if I'd married her? Mm-hmm. Where would that have in- energy have gone? Mm-hmm. Right? Like I, I wonder what my I wonder what my life would have been like. I, I honestly think it was a good thing I didn't marry her. Of course. Her. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Not because of her. Here's probably what would have happened. Um, the That energy would have gone into business, mm-hmm. right? Because the one thing about that woman I remember, like she, she, she definitely wanted to be married to a very successful dude. And I was going to be. So like that's part of like, and so, okay, cool. So I would have like, not that I wasn't going to anyway, but I, I would have gone and did something very successful. And I would have made, I would have really focused on money and financial and and that sort of success. 
And I probably would have ended up I don't know, worth a lot of money, maybe even a billionaire, depending on what field I went into or whatever. But that level of 50, 100 million, 200 million, um, uh, and because I had a lot of those paths open to, very open to me then. And if she'd been my wife, she'd have been a perfect partner for that, that sort of thing. She ended up marrying a guy who went on and became, I think, a billionaire. And like, and they're super happy and then he's doing very cool shit. And like, um, but like, you know, we would have had kids. I would have been such a shitty father at that age. But like, um, my guess is unless I had found uh, a psychedelic some other way or serious personal growth work another way, which is possible, then by the time I I, I would have gotten to early 40s, I would have either divorced her, cheated on her, something like that. Some, what what generally is called the midlife crisis. Mm-hmm. I would have had that because all that shit, the energy would have gone into success. I would have mm-hmm. gotten whatever. I would have built a company, sold it, be worth $100 million, flying private, and there's no more places there to put energy, mm-hmm. right? And so it's like, well, what now? And then it would have been other women. It would have been something else unless I had found another path into it. And I'll tell you, man, in my life, there are some people – who find their paths to growth relatively painlessly or easily. <laughs> For me, man, I generally have to suffer a lot yeah. before I start changing or do anything, man. It's like, it's, I, I am actually now finally at 48 getting to the point where like, all right, I'm going to start doing my growth as soon as I see issues That's and awesome. not let them get like, oh, now I've got to suffer a lot. Yeah. You know? uh, because um, that's generally... And so, like, when I think about it, it's like, man, I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't marry her because, like, like it would have been – and then kids, I would have had, like, you know, like, uh, there would have been a lot of fallout that I think the path I took in my life, uh, I avoided that sort of really hurting a lot of people that I would have really, really cared about and who didn't deserve it, mm. you know? And I, whereas now, man – like I married an amazing woman 15 years later when I'd done a lot of work and was kind of ready and now I'm such a better father and a better husband mm-hmm. and like I am I'm at a, a place of maturity and personal awareness and 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 self-awareness that I'm able to like uh meet the obligations I take on mm-hmm. whereas at 25 if I'd taken on marriage you know husband father obligations I don't think I would have done a very good job. Yeah. You know? So you've, you linked up, it sounds like, emotions with with uh, cognitive understanding through yeah. this process, which yeah. is one of the things. Well, I, I went all cognitive, but I was all, like most Westerners, I was all thought. I mm-hmm. Like to me, the world used to be thinking, right? Like, it, uh, at, you know, as I think, that's what is. I didn't even really under, I, of course I had emotions, right? Like, uh, but like I didn't, I thought I was feeling, but I wasn't at all. I really was not in any appreciative way, 5%, 10%, 15%, and not with any depth at all. Everything was thinking and very little was feeling. I was extremely out of balance. Um, and that is, and, and so I started talk therapy uh, from that frame because I was miserable. I mean, I was 30, whatever it was, 34. I was rich. I was famous. Um, I was in amazing shape. Everything in my life was perfect. Like it could really couldn't be much better. This is before I met my wife. Uh, but like everything else was like amazing. And, um, and I was like only a little bit happier when I was like poor, broke. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, like I was happier, but like <laughs> marginally, like 10%. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is this? Doesn't make sense. And so um, I started therapy kind of from that frame. Why am I? And then I was also like kind of lonely and miserable in a lot of ways. And even more than, you know, when I was, so like like overall I was 10% happier, but in some ways I was a lot worse, mm-hmm. you know? And so um, I started talk therapy from that frame. And so of course I picked a talk therapy modality, psychoanalysis, that's very intellectual, yeah. right? It's all about like thinking through things. And which which really was good for me for where I was uh, on my level of consciousness. That met me. If I tried to do something then that was feeling, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have worked because I know it because you couldn't feeling. I think you know? I'd, li- I'd like to pause here just for a sec because you we talked about the tools and I right. think this is a, a great point that th- if you give someone I don't know what the example is but like the most sophisticated tool 
Right. And they're a novice craftsman. Yeah. They're going to go, this is a waste of my fucking time. Dude, exactly. which, 100%. Which, which is kind of like meditation yeah. for yes. a lot of people. It's yes. like, this is not a tool for you. You're sitting quietly for 10 minutes and getting almost nothing from the yes. from the process. Oh, so, I, I tried meditation. Yeah. It was totally useless for me because I thought I was doing it wrong mm-hmm. at that point in my life. Because like I would sit there and I'm like, I can't quiet my mind. All this mm-hmm. shit's coming up. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> so I was doing it right. Yeah. I just had no concept yeah. of what right meant sure. or like it, it didn't even seem a th- – it wasn't even a thought I had in my head that, oh, all this stuff that's coming up when you're mm-hmm. sit, trying to sit quietly is the stuff that you need to feel. Mm-hmm. And and there was – I don't know if there was anything anyone ever could have said or, to me that would have gotten me to really get that at yeah. that point. Yeah. So the thing that was great about talk therapy for me is that it gave me a map of my mind, yeah. right? Which which the cognitive part is like grabs on right. and just it's great. loves. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's where I was. It helped me feel a few things, but I was still heavily resistant to feeling anything mm-hmm. because my whole life was essentially structured around not feeling the emotions that that everything, all of my success, everything was sort of built as a way to avoid these emotions. Mm-hmm. And now I like, like I was trying to go in and feel them. I was like, oh, this is like, this is antithetical to sort of everything. But like, um, so talk therapy, it helped me have a map of my emotions, a map of my mind and both what I thought and what I f- like felt, but not really like, uh, it wasn't feeling it. was a, So the, 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 the metaphor I always use is sort of like, imagine you're going to Manhattan, right? Um, if you have a, if I give you a map of Manhattan, like with all the streets and everything, and even like all the major everything marked buildings and stuff, is that is that are you in Manhattan? Yeah. No, <laughs> of course not. Like that's not. If you say I want to go to Manhattan and I give you a map, you're like, okay, cool. This I is great. I want to eat at this restaurant, right? Like, how, I'll, how's I'll that use, going for you? <laughs> I'll use the map when I'm there. Yeah. It's not useless because if you just go to Manhattan with no map, you can figure it out eventually. But fuck, it's going to take a long time, mm-hmm. right? Like it's shitty to go to Manhattan with no map. Mm-hmm. You are lost. Which which right? is a great analogy for what it is like to feel without any sort of thinking capacity. Right. It's just to be like just you need both. overwhelmed. They're with, both yeah, important, yeah. right? And there's plenty of people who are amazing feelers who can't mm-hmm. think for shit. Mm-hmm. So those are the people who were wandering ma- around Manhattan with no map. Yeah. Right. And we know, I know people like yeah. that. And, and, and so like, uh, uh, I, I got a great map of Manhattan, but talk therapy, maybe it got me to like Battery Park City and I wandered around Battery mm-hmm. Park City with the map, but nothing else in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Right. I, uh, and so like what psychedelics were, was the tool that unlocked the rest of the island. For mm-hmm. me. It gave me the ability the opportunity uh, uh, to learn that there was a rest of an island and then not just from a map, but to see, uh, look, it's right there, yeah. right? And then kind of uh, help me walk it, mm. right? And, and and because I had all those years of therapy, uh, I like I already had the map, which was great. A lot of people get into psychedelics with not much of a map, with only either no map or a vague notion. Okay, I know there's yeah. an island there and I know a couple of the streets, but that's it, right? And so that's why psychedelics can be very, very scary for a lot of people mm-hmm. because uh, without a map. But I had a really good map. And then I also had good mentors who really understood psychedelics and they helped me, it helped me fill out the rest of the map. And so like at almost no point have I been taking psychedelics without a very good map, yeah. right? Which has been, which is why I've progressed so much so quickly and they've been such a powerful tool for me is because it's like, you know, like like you said, like uh, I'm now at the level where like I can use it really effectively, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Like a uh, table saw, if you don't know how to use it, is just dangerous. But if you're trying to rip a ton of boards uh, boards down to build planks, then it's like the greatest tool of all time, right? So it's sort of like that that sort of metaphor for me. And that's what psychedelics did is uh, there was – it was it was almost like an inverse. Like talk therapy was 80% thinking, 20% feeling roughly. Mm. Psychedelics for me were the inverse. Mm-hmm. 20% thinking, 80% feeling. Like I had some realizations on psychedelics, but like I had no realizations about my parents. Mm-hmm. None. But the feeling. None. Yeah. None. I, that's just pretty – it's pretty yeah. rare for people – to do five years of intensive psychedelics with basically every medicine you can take and learn intellectually nothing about mm. your parents, your relationship with them, nothing. It was literally just feeling all the emotions behind what I already knew. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was rough. 
That was, bro, <laughs> that was hard. That was way harder than learning. Like it was, that was some shit, man. It's, yeah, it's the difference between learning about getting mugged and <laughs> getting mugged. It's the difference between Manhattan. watching porn and having sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it is, they're fundamentally different experiences. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of these, I have my own perspective and, and it was, I started with Aya and then I found your blog. I was like, oh, maybe I should do this book one stuff, yeah. <laughs> which was, yeah. it, I, Aya blew, not blew me out, eternally grateful for the things that I got, but it right. came at such a speed and in such a way that it was incredibly hard to MDMA? integrate. Ayahuasca, oh, the I, stuff yeah, that I got no, from no, that. No. You, I don't want to say you can't start there. It's just right. That's like that's like taking, uh, that's like running through Manhattan yeah. to learn. And it's like, it's too much at once. Yeah. And it's crazy. And I don't know how to navigate it in the traffic. And mm -hmm. no, dude, that's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, I have a strong, unless you're, you know, deeply spiritually pulled to something, yeah. a strong belief that MDMA is a fantastic starting point. So for, for most Westerners and for dudes, especially for any, mm -hmm. if you are highly intellectual, highly analytical, like what people call left brained. MDMA is all for those people. It's almost always the best place to start. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely one of those. Yeah. A hundred percent one of those. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of what we've done with the, or chatted about rather with the feeling connecting MDMA for somebody who hasn't done psychotherapy, I think they're going to get some story as well. Like you sort of yeah, said, they'll get a get lot them. of realization. Mm -hmm. Yes. What you've done others. And I haven't done all the ones that you've done, but uh, I think you've done psilocybin as well. You've done a boga. I'm, Pretty much all of them. Yeah. So uh, my order was MDMA, psilocybin, LSD, ketamine, uh, then uh, five meo, then aya, uh, then a boga. Got it. So, so that's pretty much all of them. So, from understanding that your perspective on these, you know, is going to be different for you every time, right. and not everybody's going to have it. Right. What do you do? You notice that you get, or that there's a different character to the the different experiences. Of course, the, yeah. each medicine is different. Yeah, and they're all optimal for different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I like them all for their thing. Yeah. Right. So if you want to feel your emotions uh, or if you have like trauma, PT, all PTSD is mm -hmm. in the most simplistic, easy to understand terms. This is not exactly scientifically accurate, but it's a very truthful statement. All PTSD is is stuck emotions. Mm -hmm. You have an emotion that is stuck in you. Yeah. And then the firecracker goes off and then. Right. Right. And you go that. back yeah. to that. Right. And so what MDMA does, the reason that it's like off the charts clinical um, success MDMA has. And there's tons and tons of studies now. I mean, you can see all the documentaries on Netflix and on Amazon Prime and like, well, like, like vets with incurable PTSD after three sessions, like are fine yeah. and all this crazy stuff. Because MD MDMA is really, it's good for one thing. And that is uh, your... What basically happens is your brain, it triggers your brain to uh, 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 release serotonin. And so you feel as loved and as safe as you've ever felt in your life. And when your brain is in that mm -hmm. state, the body is like, oh, okay, now I can release. We can heal. <laughs> I can, right, I can heal. <laughs> yeah. And the only way to heal is to feel these emotions, right? If the emotions are stuck, you cannot push them away. You cannot just get rid of them. The only way out is through. The only way out is through. Mm -hmm. So what that means is you create the conditions. MDMA is a great way to do it, to let those emotions up. You can do this with meditation mm -hmm. or with yoga. If you've ever been in a yoga class and a girl starts crying, yeah. that's what's exactly what's going on, yeah. right? Um, uh, uh, there's lots of modalities. MDMA is just a really effective modality for people who are very analytical and stuck in their mm -hmm. heads, which I was, and who have very strong ego structures. And I mean that like in a psychological sense, yeah. not, not, not arrogance, but... Um, in a psychological sense. And so uh, then everything that you've been pushing away and holding off comes up. Mm. And so what happens is like a lot of people kind of have this vision of like, oh, I'll take MDMA because maybe they did Molly once at a club. Had a great time. Right. And like, <laughs> I had a great time. So it'll be like that. I'm like, no, it's not going to yeah. be like that. <laughs> like you're going to feel that at yeah. first. And then, then it's coming. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're running from is coming. Right. And so it's often what I always tell people is, listen, this is going to get harder before it gets easier. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you take this, like literally everything you're running from is going to come, right? And the cool thing about MDMA though is that if it gets overwhelming, you can actually kind of modulate it and yeah. push it away, right? You have a little it's bit of control. It's such a great friend, partner, right. shield, right. Whereas blanket. Amaya, yeah. No, nah, you ain't yeah. got no control. You're yeah. on that fucking ride, yeah. man. And so that that was why MDMA was so great for me. Is because I control is ultimately the illusion, but I still 
It helped me feel safe. It's very gentle. Right. Yeah. And it's very gentle. And, and MDMA is always your friend. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like it's it's always on your side. And um, uh, that's what's great about it. Now, mm -hmm. that's also the downside. Mm -hmm. So if you like I have very strong ego structures. And so I like my my psychedelic journey was like five MDMA sessions before I did anything else. Mm -hmm. And by the fifth, bro, I'll never forget this. It was I think it was the fifth session. It was like halfway through and then it was like, it was like all the, er, like everything coming up just stopped. There was nothing. And like, there is no, there's no feeling of sobriety when you feel sober on a psychedelic. Like there's nothing like that. There, it is like a real, mm -hmm. like emptiness. And so I, th being very inexperienced and still a little arrogant, I thought, oh shit, I cleared out all my trauma. Done. <laughs> right? That's exactly what I thought I did. Like, oh, this is so cool. final boss. I'm done. <laughs> and so, like, you know, because I'd really at that point learned to trust the medicine, to surrender yeah. to it, to receive it, what comes up. And I'm like, nothing's coming up. I must be done. Mm. And I had thought oh, it would only take me two or three sessions. So I'm like, okay, well, it only took me, you know, five. So like it was like more than I thought, but but within the range of reasonableness, a <laughs> little bit I know. And so I was sitting there, it was like every, it was white and blank and nothing. Well, that wasn't me done. That was my ego. I'd mm. gotten to a part where my unconscious was like, no, we're not going any deeper. Mm. I know now what was behind yeah. that wall. But, um, and it was crazy, bro. Uh, I was sitting there, <laughs> like the eye shade on, beautiful, beautiful music playing. There's a guide there. And I was just kind of enjoying it, like this kind of weird floating nothingness. And you ever see those um, um, those Shark Week documentaries where they'll be like a towing a seal behind a boat with a camera and then like you don't see anything and all of a sudden <laughs> out of nowhere, like the jaws open and you're like, holy shit, that shark's right there. And it like it flips out of the air. Two you know? frames later. Right, yeah. right. That's what it felt like mm. to me. Like I was the seal though, oh, not wow. the shark. And I'll never forget this. It was um, like I've been in car wrecks and uh, I, I never, I don't think I've ever really been shot. I've never been in a true, like, like been in combat life or death situation, but like the kind of normal life and death situations you can kind of be in, in, um, you know, in America. And uh, uh, I had never felt terror like this. This was real primal terror. Mm. Um, and like how I imagine a seal would feel if they, if like, it looks down, it's like, oh fuck, that's a great white and it's yeah. 10 feet away. I'm done. Like it, it was, it felt like that. And, um, I shot up, like I jumped off of the couch and took my eye shade off. And the, the, they, like the, the guy was even like, you all right? <laughs> like, hold on. <laughs> and I was like, holy, f and, uh, so like, uh, I pushed it away and I was like, and it like it went like right away. Yeah. Like that, that terror was gone. I mean, it was still like my I was still ag up agitated, but like whatever was coming was not mm -hmm. there. Um and, and it took me another year and a half before I got behind that wall. Mm -hmm. And what that was was the grief. That was all of the grief from my childhood and mainly from my relationship with my mom. Um, and it took me quite a ways to get there to feel, I had a lot of other stuff to work through, but to, to get to the point where I felt safe enough and I was experienced enough with the medicines and I was ready to feel that. And it was, um, I got to it on five MEO DMT wow. and, and it was about a year and a half later and, um, five MEO will harvest kind of what's on top. And, um, I had taken LSD. LSD, I love LSD. It's fantastic. It's very, like LSD is very intellectual. So if you're left brain intellectual, LSD is like, that's the thing, um, especially for ideas and all that kind of stuff. But it's funny, man, for, I'm highly reactive to LSD. I took what I thought was going to be a microdose and had to lay down and heaving, racking sobs for like mm -hmm. 10 hours. And, and one of my mentors was like, he knew, he's like, uh, he didn't tell me, but he's like, 
he could see. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> oh boy. Right. Cause that like, do that's... you ever have that experience where you're talking to someone and now that you've done this, you can just, you're like, dude, I know if you do this, I know what the next well, five well, to six right. I, years I'm at the point like now you. where either I know it or yeah. like the, 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 the couple of guys that I really talk to about this, the people I talk to, cause one's a woman they like, we could be frank with each yeah. other. I'm like, Oh, great. You yeah. know, like I just like, I'll tell you, I had one with a boga too, but, um, what I, so, but at that point I wasn't quite at that stage. Mm -hmm. And and the person that uh, who was kind of leading me, he kind of knew what was coming. He knew my history, and yeah. knew, and and so he's like, he's like, look, I think five could be great for you, but just understand, like, it harvests what's on top. He when I told him, I did probably did like fifty micrograms of LSD, which is basically maybe not a microdose, but like a museum dose. And the fact that I was just heaving, racking, full body sobs, mm. like crying for eight hours, he's like. Man, like what that means is that my grief was that close to the surface. Yeah. So when you say harvest was on top, you mean it's ready. It's to right come. there. Yeah. Right. Like I'm only yeah. barely holding it. Yeah. In, holding it in. You know, like if someone feels real anxious or like they're about to cry, that means it's right on top. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I have a very strong ego structure, meaning like defenses, like my, my brain and my body are very good at keeping emotions away. Mm. Um, and so like, I, it, you couldn't have told me a week before that, uh, that microdose of LSD that I was like real sad or had a lot of grief, but I was still that disconnected yeah. from myself. And so he's like, all right, well, if you're ready to go deep, 5-MeO might be a good call for you because it really kind of harvests what's on top. And and I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, and I, I knew what kind of 5 it's the God molecule and all that stuff. And so I did it. Well, some people that might not know, but they call it the God molecule because some people feel like they experience God directly. I mean, you kind of yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's kind of the thing. It is, It is. I think, the best medicine for mind expansion. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to learn about the universe and experience other dimensions and all, like five is the medicine. That's mm -hmm. the thing. That's the best at it um, in a lot of ways because it goes the deepest, the quickest. And it's, it's it, I mean, it. There's a good argument and actually a lot of data that it is the connection with other dimension and other realms, mm. right? It, to the extent that they exist, like this is the portal. But, and so I was expecting to have that experience. He was in his own gentle way, like, well, he's like, you may have that experience, but it may just harvest what's on top, right? I didn't know what he mm -hmm. meant at the time. So uh, I did four sort of like uh, inhalations or whatever, mm -hmm. which is a lot. And bro, I thought I was going to die of grief. It was just nothing but grief. Ugh. I didn't see God. I didn't go to another planet. Like you read trip reports of 5-MeO, they tend to be fairly consistent. This is my 5-MeO. I, I had no, <laughs> ex nothing like any yeah. of that shit, dude. It was so much grief. I thought I was feeling the grief of the world and I thought I was actually going to die from grief. And um, now, like it, it, bro, it set me sideways for weeks. It was so hard. Like it almost broke, it pushed me to the breaking point and not over, but it was right there. Man. Mm. And, um, fuck, that was hard. And then for the next year, it didn't matter what medicine I did. Just like, grief. Right. And so if I do mushrooms, the grief would come up in the mushroom way, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird, dark and symbolic and mm -hmm. associative. If MDMA, it was just feeling grief, just yeah. grief. Yeah. Um, if it was, uh, you know, LSD, it was just heaving, racking sobs, right? So each medicine would access it on its kind of own terms, but it was nothing but grief because I had a fuckload of grief. Wow. And yeah, that I had not felt for 40 something years, wow. right? And so it was, uh, but bro, when I, there was a point where I was like, like, what the fuck? Like, is this the rest of my life just feeling grief? Because it, it was about a year to a year and a half mm -hmm. of, I might have, in that period, I did six, maybe eight medicine sessions, and it didn't matter what I did. It was just overwhelming grief. Hmm. And then it was like, it was like one of the Aya sessions. It was like, oh, I'm done. Hmm. Like, I'm done with grief from the past. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm through. And it was like, oh, shit. Okay. And it, it was so, so, I mean, I lost, when I started psychedelic therapy i was 195 pounds i'm now like 175 um and nothing diet didn't change exercise didn't change nothing um stayed basically the same weight everything is so fundamentally different in my life dude about like i'm the same dude but i'm just like so much happier so much lighter so much um 
I mean, it's like, it's like, I didn't even realize how lonely and miserable and shitty I was either because I was so used to it mm-hmm. and I built so many coping mechanisms. And now it's like, dude, life is fucking great. You know, it's not like I don't have any worries. Mm-hmm. Like things happen, you know, like, of course, man. But like, it's also part of why I had to move out like onto like, uh, you know, a ranch and stuff mm-hmm. because it was like you're out into nature. Cause now it's like, it's hard for me to be around a lot of people um, because most people haven't done any work mm-hmm. and they're just buzzing, jittering, anxious, sad. Uh, like they're exactly how I used to be. And it's like hard to be around that. Yeah. Your higher sensitivity. Right. Yeah. And it's like both because I'm very empathic about it. Like, mm-hmm. fuck, man, I can, I can see or I can feel exactly what they're feeling. I don't want to feel it. Like, I don't, it's not mine, it's theirs, mm-hmm. but still it's like, and I can see the way they react and I'm like, oh God. Cause like, it's not, not in a judgmental way. Yeah. Like I, like I feel bad for them and I know what exactly what it's like. Cause that used to be me. Yeah. You know? And that's to your load. It feels like if you're, I, I've, I've dude, experienced hard, that lately. Dude. I, I think uh. I, I hear or believe that there's a, another side to it where you you can get used to being empathic like that without taking on the grief of other people yes but as it's, it's, as i'm starting it's, it's I, I moved out i moved to malibu i was like i can't be in the downtown area with all of i don't even know how you can be in la like that whole yeah. city like i had to go there for something i don't leave the house <laughs> Dude, i mean like i was i lived there for yeah. i hated it when i was there so i at least was connected enough with myself but then this last time I was there for like three days mm-hmm. and I was like, holy fuck, this place is fucked. Like I couldn't. Just heavy. I like. So this is, ugh. this is the, what you're describing. And, and I'm, I'm glad that it's coming from you because I've heard, I think you're a really good messenger for a lot of this stuff, given your history yeah, right. and your. What most people know me for. <laughs> well, your groundedness in right. like Western yeah. winning <laughs> is. I'm an American. For yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. And to be like, no, I feel the vibe of a city yeah. and it's, I'm not, it's, it's not because I, I was born on the mountain. Like coming into Austin yeah. now is like, I'll do it, mm-hmm. but it's not a, an overall pleasant experience most mm-hmm. of the time. And I like this city. You know, and it's changed a lot. We got a lot of asshole Californians now we didn't have before, but like, (laughs) that's not the issue. It's like cities just are major cities, especially Mm -hmm. in America are so dysfunctional Mm -hmm. and so fucked. And it's like, and it's, it's one of those things where it's, I think it's hard to notice when you're at a certain conscious level, which I, where I've spent most of my life. And when you get past a certain level, you feel it and you realize, you know, like, I can't be around this anymore, yeah. you know? What I've noticed, I mean, I, I've, I've used the term sensitivity because, yeah, it feels like my dial got turned up. So, n- like, noises, yes. people that are repressing emotions, yeah. like, all of those things that were so— Smells, like, even. Smells. Yeah. I just had a journey, man, and I can smell now. <laughs> It was like my girlfriend be like, you need to shower. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. And now it was, uh, it, for me, it was a journey of connecting with the feminine and being like, oh my God, I can taste, I can smell, I can, uh, I feel in and of the world. And then you go to an airport, like I did to get here. Yeah. And it's just, Dude, airports are the worst. blows out your senses. And it's, I understand I why people have to ratchet down that sensitivity in order to make it through one 24 yeah. hour span in lo- the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I remember trying to sleep there the first time. It's like, you got to dial down everything. It's not even the noise, too. Mm-hmm. Like, noise is is a big part of it, but it's everything else. It's, it is. It, this is the sort of conversation that if I had heard when I was 33, be like, these fucking kooks, pussies. what the hell's wrong with them? <laughs> not even pussies, just like they're kooks. Like, what are yeah. they fucking talking about? Well, because that's the thing, man. A lot of really spiritual people are fucking kooks. Mm-hmm. A lot, they are. And there's quite a few like spiritual who put, people who put themselves out there as spiritual who are doing what I call spiritual bypass, right? They are wearing the airs of someone spiritual and talking about that shit, but they actually haven't done any of the work. Mm-hmm. Like, I know... You probably know these people. I know I know so many people that Austin's who've done like 50 ayahuasca trips mm. and are fucked up assholes who are toxic shitheads, right? And like they say all the right things, but they have not actually done any of them. Mm-hmm. Like do doing drugs is not the same thing as doing the work. You can fucking do ayah a hundred times and get worse. Yeah. I've known some that they they get worse in the sense that they they think they've 
Aya especially. I don't know why that one specific medicine attracts that type of person. I think because you almost always have a peak experience yeah. on Aya. And so you feel like you've done something. It's like, imagine if you did CrossFit like once a month. And you think you're a professional crossfit. Yeah, if somebody like right. helicopters you to the top of Everest. Right. And it's you think just you're like, a climber. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> that really is it. Yeah. And, and like, and so I, th- I maybe that's why Aya is so, because like, like Iboga, you, Iboga beats, kicks your ass, right? And LSD kicks your ass. And so like, but with mushrooms a little bit and with Iboga a lot, or with Aya a lot, you can kind of, fin- if you get experience with the medicine, you can finesse your way away from doing work with the medicine. Mm. I, it's not the medicine's fault. It's it's the way you take it and the way you go at it. And and for whatever reason, there are definitely a lot of people who 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 will just on and on about Aya and do Aya this and Aya that. And like uh they're worse because they think they've done their work and they haven't. Mm-hmm. And those are actually the most dangerous people to be around um by far. Mm. Like I, I learned that too. Like I didn't have any of those people as my mentors, but I've seen those people and how they deal with it. It's why people are like, man, I like, um, I know a lot of MDMA guides that I recommend. I only know two IA guides. I think most people pouring IA are dangerous and shouldn't be doing it. They, they shouldn't, they have not dealt with enough of their mm. own stuff because IA very specifically, you open yourself up, you know, cause a, an IA shaman, a good one, one who's experienced and, and and mentored for, you know, a decade and has been doing this and done their own work, you know, is singing. And they are very much a part of your experience. Yeah. They are moving the emotions. They're, for lack of a better term, they're kind of in your head. They're conducting the room. Right. Yeah. And so if they haven't done their work, they are, they're a real danger, like a real danger. Whereas like, you can have someone sit for you on MDMA and there's not a whole lot, like they, they can have an influence definitely, but um, there's not a lot that they can do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not talking like if they rape you or something, that's different. I'm talking about someone mentally and emotionally. Like mm-hmm. if someone's just a criminal, they're just a criminal. I'm yeah. not talking about that. Um, but there are a lot of people pouring Aya, like in Austin, who I I think are dangerous. Yeah. Like even, and I'm, I'm not talking about criminal. Like they're not hurting, they're not- No, they don't mean to. They're not stealing from yeah. people. They're not molesting them. Like that's just, those people just need to go to jail. But they think they're helping and they're really not because they haven't done any of their own, they haven't done enough of their own work. You know, right? it's, somebody said to me, it was, I think it was an Irish shaman, it said, yeah, there's always work being done, but it's just not clear whose it is. And the idea, it's like, look, this is them working out their shit and you are an unwilling, un, uh, or consenting participant yeah. in in them working out their Yeah, stuff. I'm at the point now where I don't use guides much anymore. Yeah. Um uh, uh, not that I know great guides, but it's just that um, I think you can get to a level where um, once you're experienced with the medicine, that um, facing yourself alone mm. is um, kind of a, the, like that. That's a level to go yeah, yeah. and to deal with. You know, I, some people can start there and it works for them, um, but I think for most people, having a guide is really, really important at the beginning. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, um, even if you can source your own medicine, hmm. which which a lot of people can now, um, but like the the guide is very important um, simply because like MDMA, because what's going to come up is a lot of shit like very unsafe emotions, uh, emotions that feel unsafe, and so knowing that like your space is controlled and there's a person there, a great uh, MDMA guide, they'll tell you you're taking a six hour meeting with yourself. Hmm. I'm not going to talk to you unless you need me. Mm-hmm. Like, unless you initiate the conversation, I'll talk back. I'll respond. You know, if you want me to hold your hand, I'll do it. But if you have no interaction with me, that's okay too. Yeah. My job is to secure the space around you mm-hmm. so that you know nothing's coming, physical is coming mm-hmm. in. No one's going to interfere. I won't let you hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, which it's very, very rare on MDMA. You have any sort of hallucinations yeah. or anything like that. But like... Uh, you know, like you're going to be physically. It's more that open. you know that you're not right. going to. Exactly. Because the, the fear that I could do that can get in the way more than the actuality exactly. of Exactly. Me, of and me. so that's a way of not doing your yeah. work. So a good guide is essentially a way for you to to sub out that and mm-hmm. like, okay, I don't have to worry about that. But as you get more experience with yourself in the medicine, um, uh, in my experience for me, uh there's a lot of benefit to doing without a guide, but mm-hmm. I mean, whatever. I mean, the point is like... um we're talking about uh, 
It's very easy. I see this a lot too. It's very easy to get lost in this stuff. Like a, I call it like the the three session um, promoter. Like I don't know, you've probably seen this where someone I mean, will do I, like I was three this. sessions and they're like, <laughs> everyone's got to do this. No, I and did I'm, one and I was just. <laughs> bro, do you know how many people have like entrepreneurs yeah. will do this? Like the, every single one. They're ready for a mastermind. Bro, now. They'll, they'll, they'll have two sessions <laughs> yeah. and they'll call me and they're like, we got to start a business with this. And I'm like, I've, I'm not kidding. I've had this conversation 50 times. Yeah. And I'm like, no, stop, back up. Yeah. And I'll walk them through. I'm like, you know, yeah, yeah, business is great. Yes, talking about this is great. But the time for that yeah. is when you have done, you know, a certain portion of your work. You are not ready right now at all. It's why it's I, I did this after my like third session or second session. And thank God I had a mentor who's like, Tucker, I know you're going to talk about this. The only way you're allowed to talk about this is to talk about your experience yeah. in your first session or two. That's it. Nothing else. Not the words you have to, you, you should, should, you shouldn't. You must. <laughs> uh, those cannot be in the article. And like he knows me well yeah, yeah. enough where it was like, uh, yeah. it was like, yeah, friendly. Like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, okay. I get, and I got it. I'm like, okay, I got it. And if you read the first piece I wrote about MDMA, there's, it's only my experience. I don't talk about anyone else. And I'm so fucking glad yeah. I, I listened to him and did that because the right, I was not in the right space to talk about it beyond my, anything beyond my own experience. Now, when I talk about it, like I can be like, okay, like let's talk about it from like someone who's been through enough that I understand the ups and downs. I have seen, I have been into my darkest places, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them, mm -hmm. pretty much all of them. Uh, and so like, I, like I know what that's like. I understand what's coming. I understand where the pitfalls are because I've hit a lot of them, right? Um, and one of the major pitfalls is uh, thinking you've done more work than you have. Mm. I went through this phase twice. Twice I thought I would. Like, probably right. continue to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't think I'm going to do it. If I do it now, it's, it's, it's short and small. Like, I think I'm one step ahead of where I am. And then I have pretty good mechanisms to to uh, uh, to be self aware, whereas like a dude calling me because he wants to start a business and do a podcast on psychedelics after two sessions is fifteen steps mm -hmm. ahead of where mm -hmm. uh, he actually is, and so that that's another major thing, man. Because because bro, it's like you carry this burden for thirty years or forty years, and all of a sudden you've it let comes from a good twenty percent off. Yeah. Oh, it's a great it's place, beautiful. But you let twenty percent yeah. off, and you feel like I've never found a product like this. This, oh, this needs to everyone needs. You this. feel yeah. like a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, it goes like this: the curve is you start here. And then you go up, you feel amazing, and then you come down. And now you have to do the right. And you got to get through the yeah. dark part. Is yeah. not the beginning. You for some people it is. Like I've definitely seen people who like they got in the dark shit right away. <laughs> it's like oh boy, mm. like uh, I'm almost jealous of them because like damn, like that you went right there. It took me years to get there, but like that hard, you got to get through the di the re the dip. Like what Seth mm -hmm. Godin would call the dip. It's the same thing, mm. except in psychedelics, it's facing your shadow. What Young calls a shadow. Yeah. Are you going to look into your darkest parts, and are you going to face them? And the only way to face them is to actually feel what those emotions are and integrate those. Right. Mm. So now it's like I to bring that back to me and my grief. I understand. Like with my mom, uh, like I get. Her, why she was the way she was, um, not just intellectually, but emotionally. Like she, her parents were kind of fucked up and, and did fucked up shit to her. And she was very much a product of her time and um, confused and, and like, you know, like never had the strength to kind of do any of her own work. And, and like, uh, like when she was pregnant with me, I don't know, have you ever had like the experiences of going back to like, like the womb and yeah. stuff? Okay. Yeah, it took me years to, to have uh, one of those. But. I, I'm glad you asked because this, for a lot of people, this needs to go slow because it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. you can have any recollection, it, I don't talk experience. About this. I don't yeah. talk about this with people who haven't yeah. gone through it. Yeah. Because it sounds fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean, remember the womb? Yeah. That's fucking nonsense. <laughs> but the, I am a big believer in my experiences. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I heard other people talk about this. People I know 
And it was trust, interesting that that is a very self-loving thing to, and, to do and say to well, be, to believe your own experiences. Yes. It uh-huh. took me I don't know how many times it has taken me some experiences to finally fucking believe myself. <laughs> I, I'm I've gotten that's a big part of the work for me is getting I I've always been really good about that in certain areas, mm-hmm. but then in other areas not. Spiritually, for me, it's been like believing that I had this experience of being in the womb, believe like that. But Continue, please. Well, I, uh, so I, I heard people that I know and trust who are smart and, and legit in all ways that I know, like behind the famous people, but I know behind the scenes. Like I know who they are, mm-hmm. right? Like I know where they sleep. I know how they act. Like um, talk about this to me, not even on like podcasts. And I'm like, all right, I don't disbelieve you, but this sounds fucking mm-hmm. goofy. Like, you know, it's like, it's one of those things that like, like, you know, you can't talk about sex to a virgin. They can't get it. <laughs> Same thing. And so I had, um, it took me years to get to the, to back to the womb, uh, to feel that. Um, and I felt it and mm. it was crazy. I could feel my mother's anxiety, yeah. her fear, her torment, what she was worried about. I can it all impact could feel it impacting me like i could almost feel like the hormonal changes but i also could feel her thoughts mm. like i knew what she was thinking or at least feeling right maybe not the exact intellectual thoughts but i could i could absolutely feel the fears and the worries and anxieties and the, all that and so i was like oh, okay i get why she did this like it doesn't make it right or whatever but like i mean to understand is to is to forgive yeah. you know and so I was like, all right. And plus forgiveness for me. I can let go of this now. I'm not, yeah, what she did was fucked up, no doubt. Mm-hmm. But like, um, even without letting her, because she's still, she hasn't changed at all. She's still, all her problems are exactly, maybe even worse now. Um, and so she's not a part of my life, dude. Like, uh, like it's funny. My wife and I have traveled these two paths with our moms. And her mom, she, my wife sent a ton of her work. Her mom sent a ton of her work. And they're coming together. They're getting closer and closer because they're both doing their work. Mm. My mom, not doing any, won't do any. Wow. Like, and so it's like, there's just no, there's no basis upon which to have a relationship. Did grief come up around that as well? I imagine that. No, man, not really. Mm. The grief for me was the rejection. Yeah. Like the my mom not wanting me. Um. But then weirdly, she had the opportunity to give me up for adoption to a, to my godparents, who were the most amazing people. Like the only reason I'm not a sociopath is because I had those two people in my life when I was young loving me. And so I got enough of like love from them that like, like I wasn't a broken sociopath. Mm-hmm. Like if I hadn't had them, I'd probably a gold, be a managing partner at Goldman Sachs now worth, you know, whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars and doing horrible shit and yeah. ruining the world. Like, I really would, because I'm that smart. But I wouldn't have had um, enough love. Like, you got to have something to grow on, you know? Um, and I had, they, it's like I got the minimum necessary amount from them, mm. you know? But they were willing to adopt me, and she said no. And it's like, well, bitch, you don't want him. <laughs> Give him to the people who do. And, and like, you know, because for her, I think it was... Uh, you know, she didn't want to go through the social shame of giving up a kid and all that kind of stuff, right? So it was like I kind of got the worst of both worlds from her. And, like, she loved me all she could. She just didn't, you know, if someone doesn't love themselves and doesn't, you know, how can they love you, mm. right? So I fully believe she gave everything she had, and she loved as much as she could. She just had ex- very, very little to give. Yeah. And she was very fucked up in her own way and got no help and did nothing, you know, to her own work. And so, like, I was just uh, the downstream effect of that, right? So it wasn't she wasn't trying to hurt me, mm-hmm. you know. Like it wasn't an intentional thing. Um, but it is. But it's the same with my dad. My dad, you know, like he has all his problems, and they yeah. they picked each other for a reason. Yeah. And they were, and so. Um, well, I'm just thinking that it's it's crazy how influential you have been on so many people in the world too do this, you know, with that, with that a, one block rejection. List. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. I guess it's, I don't know, I feel empathetically or just uh, my own shit of like, oh, that's the two people that would be so wonderful to influence in that direction. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not, it didn't go that way. It, that, that's just not in, in, in my card. Yeah. Like I even reached out, like, I'm get too deep in the story, but like uh, reached out to my mom about halfway through the work to not necessarily, 
People are like, oh, you got to fix it. No, you don't have to fix a relationship mm-hmm. with, with your parent. If they're dysfunctional and they're not willing to have a healthy relationship and, yeah. and to follow basic boundaries, you don't have to have a relationship with them. And so, like, I kind of reached out to her, uh, opened the door. Because, bro, she's never met her grandkids. Wow. Right? And she doesn't even know her daughter-in-law, my wife. Wow. She doesn't know. She's never met any of them. And so uh, opened the door for it, and then she basically uh, – closed it mm. right like she she essentially rejected again mm. in a sense right and it's funny that was definitely a situation of when that happened that was like three christmases ago when that happened i thought oh well okay this sucks but i was through it and then it was after that that i got into mm-hmm. the grief uh, i was able to get in the grief with my mom i wasn't yeah. before yeah like i'd done enough work where i'm like okay let's let's either start to mend this relationship or Close, close it off and I can forgive her and move on. It was one or the other, right? Because it was still kind of open, right? It was like mm-hmm. an open loop. Yeah, grief is about loss. Right, and then <laughs> and then once she kind of like closed the door, then it, then I was actually able to get in the grief. It yeah. was right after that, actually. Mm. I did 5-MEO like a month after, the, and then it, or I did the LSA and the 5-MEO was like maybe a month after that. So it was like, okay, here it comes. Uh, but like, um, uh, yeah, so like she, that that has been extremely important is dealing with all those emotions, right? Feeling them. And then it's like, okay, like intellectually, it's all, I can I can understand intellectually, I felt these emotions. Bro, there's still a sadness there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like there's always going to be a grief there, a grief for the mother I never had, mm-hmm. you know? Like, bro, I can watch my wife with my kids. And she's such a good mom, man. Like the thing she is that is, she is, I, my wife is the opposite of my mom in so many ways. You know, like you, the saying, like you, you marry your parent yeah. or the opposite of, yeah. of your parent, your, your, your opposite sex parent. I married the opposite of my mom and especially in terms of motherhood. Mm. My wife is so emotionally connected and attuned mm. to our kids. Like my kids are so fucking emotionally healthy, man. Like they don't even have transition objects. Like a, a transition ob- object is like a pacifier. Or something. Like yeah, a passy or like a doll. Because in the Western world, the way we deal with kids is really fucked up. And so a lot of times, like as kids grow, they have to essentially have a, a love object, mm. a, an attachment object, because they don't get enough with their, mm. from their parents. Interesting. Um, which is going like there's a book called The Continuum Effect. You can read about this. It's really good. But um. And she read all the books, but it's much more about who she is. Mm-hmm. Like, our, my kids didn't even have transition objects. Like, my oldest son kind of had a doll he was on to for like a week or something when he kind of moved into his own room, and that was it. Like, my daughter didn't. Uh, third son has one he kind of likes, but like, and then the the youngest now, she didn't get, they they she's so attached to them, and and they you can just when you interact with them, you can see they feel so loved. And so cared for from the, the most important people, like mm. their mom and their dad and they, their grandmother. Um, and so it's like they have such a security to them that's like – and a confidence. You know, they're not confident. My four-year-old's not confident, you know, crossing the street or something, <laughs> right? But just a, a – um, That his emotions are okay, yeah. Right, because you can see other kids and you can tell like they're not – Mm. They don't have that. Like, mm-hmm. and I didn't really even realize until because not like I was hanging out with a lot of young kids before I had kids, <laughs> right? Like I'm not, you know, I'm not in Hollywood. So like <laughs> so, doesn't really doesn't like California. Right, got, that, got that one in. But like uh uh so many uh kids like are not like that. Mm. You know, it's like, ooh, and I see their parents like, okay, well, they're doing the best they can, but they they never got this and they're not man, and so it's like I the, I'm bringing that up because it's like that was one of the hardest things for me is my wife was so much like that with our first son. And that was so hard for me because I never got that, you know, to see I know exactly. a little boy have his mom and grandmother just love him and adore him and worship him. And like, and I was so, what part of me so happy? Like, this is my son getting everything I didn't get. So I wasn't mad at him, but it was just like, it was such a gut punch for me mm-hmm. um, because it brought up. Like that's the grief. I never got that. One of the things I've I've seen, I remember watching, and it, I don't know the truth of it, Finding Neverland, and it was about the Michael Jackson stuff, and there yeah. was the kid who had been yeah. abused by him, and yeah. it was only when he had a kid that was his age at the time that he, he was got, able to yeah. get it to connect with it. Yes, yeah. and it's there's something about that, and if you don't, 
if you don't do the work, what, what I've, you know, know can happen is that resentment can build up in the father. Fuck and this. and it's like, yes. that motherfucker is getting everything Dude. that I can't give myself and didn't get. The God's honest truth yeah. is I had a few moments yeah. like that where not conscious, yeah. but unconscious. And I was already in therapy. And the only reason I was able to recognize yeah. those and deal with them is because, like I said, talk therapy was 80% intellectual, but there was some emotional stuff, right? And so that's the only reason I was able to recognize that when I was doing mm -hmm. it and be like, okay, I'm not, this yeah. is not okay. I'm not going to do this to him. This yeah. is, And it's not his shit. Yeah. Me upset at him. Like that's not that he, cause he's getting love. Like that's mm -hmm. nonsense. There was not much of it, but there was enough where I was like, oh, okay. This yeah. Is not, this is not going to fly. Good catch. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously the person that you need to get to doing it for is yourself, but it, Doing it for your kids, Gabor Mate says the number one thing that you can offer your yeah, kids is, you know, is your own sense of okayness. <laughs> yeah. I will use that lever on people who come to me for help. Yeah. It works. Here's the God's honest truth. I didn't do this for my kids. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I don't think that, I think I it's better if you do it for yourself. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. Right. I did yeah. not, I've not done any of this for my kids or my mm -hmm. wife. Um, uh, I'm so glad like I did it because I, I really like them and I like, I like being a great father and a great husband, and I like our, our relationship. My, you know, it's like everyone says they love their family. Mm -hmm. I actually like my family. Um, and so much of what I'm building now is about our family and everything together. But um, no, I don't do it. I, I never, I, I, I guess it's probably because I just never had that growing up. They just not, it's never a thought in my head mm -hmm. that I'm doing this for them. I absolutely. I pay attention to how it impacts them and, and they matter to me a lot, but my work is only for me. It's only about me. I don't, I don't live in the world of, of, uh, I don't know what you call it, obligation to others. Like I don't, I, my life is mine, mm. not theirs. Mm. Just like they're, I can't stand people who are like, you know, little league dads who push all their shit mm -hmm. on their kids. No, I don't do that to them. Their life is theirs. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, that's another thing I had to go through. Like when, when my first son came, like, you know, I grew up playing sports and whatever, and he wasn't into any of that shit. I'm glad now it's like healthy because most team sports now, so my, my perspective on them nine years later is very different than it was then. But like, um, no, well, I'm, I'm militant about that now. Like, their life is theirs. They even, they, like, they, they know, like, you know, my body, my rules, mm. right? Like, they know if it's legal and safe, they get to choose it themselves. Mm. So, like, if we go out and my four-year-old wants to wear uh, stupid fucking clothes, <laughs> then he can wear stupid fucking clothes, mm. right? Because he loves them. If he wants to wear a skin-tight Spider-Man outfit and, like, some goofy Elmer Fudd hat and, like, pink rain boots— yeah, I mean, he's going to look ridiculous in certain <laughs> ways. Uh, uh, but I love it because he's decided that's how he's going to express himself. And that's cool because anything else, that's safe. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously legal. And, and so, like, why would I? I don't, ha I don't, it's his life. It's not mm -hmm. mine. Like, so by the same token, I just don't see my work as being to, to do it for them is to say that I, I live for someone else and I don't. Mm. I love them and care about them and so much of, uh, I, they mean so much to me, but my life is mine and their, and their life is theirs. Mm. So. Tell me about um, what do you get emotionally out of uh, the ranch that you live on? I know that you like, it's there's lower stimulation out there. You've now been there for a while. You connect with yourself. Yeah. I like we human the world is an energetic system, right? All Just to slow down. Is, you you've you've moved like an hour yeah, outside of Austin. I'm an hour outside of Austin. You've got animals, you've right, got town called Dripping Springs. Yeah. It's a pretty rural town. Mm -hmm. Like there's no water. So like you have to drill wells so that like mm -hmm. development's limited. Right. And so like um look, I believe I believe, I mean, this is just basic science. Uh, uh, all things are energy, right? Just, you know, this wood and our flesh are just slowed down energy. And we're all part of this system, the earth, uh, at a minimum, right? Before you even get deeper than that. And uh, so much about cities is disconnecting from our environment, from from the, the, the natural uh, environment uh, and the natural system that we're a part of, right? And... Um, I just don't think that that's healthy. That doesn't work. You know, like 
If you're unsure about that, go look at how any animal acts in a zoo. <laughs> That's a human living in a city. Hmm. It, the metaphor is exactly the, I mean, it is right on, hmm. right? And zoos have gotten a lot better at replicating a natural environment, but still, like, mm -hmm. you've never seen a happy animal in a zoo. Mm. You know, maybe a fish or something, but, like, <laughs> mammals are all miserable in zoos. And, and uh, especially if you see them in the wild. And so, um, uh, like, it's same for humans. Mm. And, and our natural environment is, it really could be anywhere. I mean, like, if you like the mountains of Colorado, mm -hmm. cool. If you like the desert of West Texas, cool. What matters uh, is that you are in a natural environment that you enjoy, that works for you. And it's such a basic thing. I mean, it's why people spend all this money going to, you know, uh, national parks and this and that and like the beach and because that's where we should be. That's a healthy place. Mm. And so um, that's a big part of why we moved on land is it, it, it's not just about like, bro, I've not found a better way to connect with myself than being in a place that is nourishing and and uh, a f species and physically appropriate for me, mm. you know? Like there's nothing wrong with concrete. It's not evil. It's just not species appropriate, mm -hmm. you know? It's not how we were designed and whenever you have a mix, I mean, you, you could have, I don't know, there could be some creature that's designed to be in a concrete type situation. I mean, I don't know, mountain goats that like, yeah, you know, yeah. come up, like, <laughs> no, seriously, they live in like, um, uh, you know, very rocky Afghani yeah. style terrain or something. It's about species appropriateness. We understand it for all animals and it's like people just forget it for humans. Yeah. And so for, for me, where I live um, is like one about connecting with myself and connecting with nature. And then also, man... It's like, I didn't really get this before I moved there. But now that I'm there, this is two years in. Like, like I think October 1st was our two-year anniversary. Dude, I've built companies. I've written books. I've built a lot of things, right? Most people go through their lives and they never really build. They don't do it. Nothing is really theirs. They work at a company. They're in some suburb with a homeowner. So they don't actually own anything. I have built things and own things. But, dude, there is nothing like the feeling you get from building, developing, whatever you want to call it, your own land, mm. right? And I'm not talking about building houses. That's cool. I am talking about like we bought a place that was beautiful but dead. Mm. Like it was, we bought it from some boomer who ran it essentially like a golf course, right? Like beautiful grass, like literal St. Augustine grass, which is like mm. what you have on yeah, golf yeah. courses. But, like, the only way you keep that alive is, like, 100 inches of rain a year. So it's irrigated. Mm -hmm. And you got to use uh, uh, these ridiculous fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and all this shit. And so I got there and I'm like, this is horrible. I don't want to live on a golf course. Living on a golf course out in nature is no different <laughs> than living in a city. It's, they're both artificial, yeah. right? So I really dove into to permaculture and to regenerative agriculture, and I'm like, oh, shit, these guys have got this figured out. And so I essentially, oh, dude, and for about 18 months, our place was a disaster because it was like, all right, I have to let all this shit die, and uh, we essentially have to let nature take back over. Mm -hmm. And then, add, and I can expedite that some ways, help you know improve the soil, et cetera, but there's, there's ways to do it that are natural that are healthy and there's mm -hmm. ways to do it where like that play, his place looked beautiful, but was dead. Yeah, I yeah. wanted a place that looked beautiful, but was alive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now it's like, we got mushrooms coming up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, bro, there's the first year we were there, there were no insects. It was the weird, we're in Texas mm -hmm. and there were no insects, which on one hand was like, great. Like, yeah. No, no, hardly any mosquitoes. <laughs> You're selling me. Like no scorpions <laughs> yeah. because he killed everything. Mm, yeah. yeah. Now it's like, there's fucking scorpions everywhere. Right. Oh, it's man. like, but but that's a sign of a healthy ecosystem because there's tons of bugs. And, and because there's tons of bugs, uh, because the soil is healthy, all kinds of stuff is growing, tons more bugs, uh, tons more birds who eat the bugs, like birds fucking everywhere. And like uh, blue jays and cardinals, not those horrible grackles yeah. that are around Austin. Like all these birds, uh, amazing everywhere. And because there's tons of birds, there's bats. Uh, like we have bats everywhere now. And then the chickens are, uh, we brought on, like they're mm -hmm. not wild chickens, but they have like these amazing healthy eggs because they're eating the bugs. And we let them very free range over big areas. And, you know, because we brought in sheep and the sheep, 
but there's nothing that regenerates land better than animal shit. Mm. Well, human shit's actually the best, but animal <laughs> shit's second. And so the sheep graze everything, and we re- like put in fescue and all these other grasses. Uh, more, fescue's not natural for Texas, but it's kind of close. And and so the sheep are like grazing the front lawn and the back. Like this, the boomer we bought at the room would die if you saw yeah, like, yeah. sheep eating the grass, right? I don't mow the lawn. Uh-huh. That's why we have sheep. And then we yeah, eat yeah. the sheep. And so as we, we're two years in, by the time we're four or five years in, we're going to have essentially a closed system. Yeah. Right? I mean, rain and sun. Yeah. But are the are, are the are the external inputs. But everything else is going to be, we're going to have this amazing abundant system mm-hmm. with all kinds of shit growing everywhere. Chickens, uh, uh, sheep, bees, like tons of honey, like oh, we're going to be producing all, we're already producing a lot, but it's going to be incredibly abundant and everything's going to be insanely healthy because we're doing it in a way, in the healthiest way possible, right? Mm-hmm. All of this shit works if you do it with nature as opposed to, to nature. And it's so funny, man. I feel like, like a kooky environmentalist, except what's funny now is the the environmentalists are now actually corporatist assholes. They're mm-hmm. the ones like, you shouldn't eat meat. Yeah. And like, where do you think that food comes from? It comes from huge monoculture farms yeah, yeah. that require massive combines that Talking use about tons like of oil. Vegetarian, like right, yeah, vegetarian yeah. stuff, right? And then it goes, it gets shipped on uh, on in huge trucks to factories that have to process it with 70 chemicals. And mm-hmm. I'm like, nothing about this is mm-hmm. is environmental. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I, I mean, oh dude, like uh, it's uh, everything is shifting in such a weird, funny way. Like how I, I'm doing a lot of the things that the kooky <laughs> spiritual leftist environmentalist used to do, but from a whole different yeah. angle now. Like, like I'm literally dressed like this because I'm about to go hunting. I'm yeah. leaving here, going to my hunting lease, and we're hunting. But like, tell me about tell me about thing. well, what are the uh, the emotional spiritual experience of harvesting your own animal yeah. product and hunting? Yeah. So I hate the way so many people talk about this. Man, before I did this, you would have those people, you know, you have the anti, you know, the vegans or whatever, but they're kooks. Um, or they're just dogmatic. They're fundamentalists, right? They don't actually think. They just believe one thing and, and evidence doesn't matter to them. But then you have the people who kind of do this. You talk, oh, it's so spiritual and this and that. And I didn't understand what they meant until I did it, right? And I think the way most people talk about it doesn't make sense. And now I understand why I didn't understand what they were talking about. I'm going to give you an example and then we're going to come back to it. Before I had kids, everyone used to tell me, you're going to learn so much from your kids. Mm. And I would always be like, that's stupid. What's a four-year-old going right. to teach me? Right, what the fuck <laughs> is a four-year-old going to teach me? Like, that's dumb. I'm like, you must be stupid, mm. right? That's always, it, sometimes I would say it, but usually that's just what I think. <laughs> and then I had kids and I learned a shitload from them. But they were they were right. But they were right for a reason none of them were explaining. Because most people don't actually know what they're talking about. They're just repeating what they were told. My kids taught me a bunch, not because they taught me anything. They didn't teach me anything. I learned a bunch from them because their behavior was a mirror of my behavior, mm-hmm. right? And so like all of my flaws and the things I hid from or denied about myself, they would either imitate or react against. Mm-hmm. And so kids act as a mirror for you. And if you're willing to be honest with yourself and self-aware, you will learn a shitload about yourself. Mm-hmm. They don't teach you anything on purpose because mm-hmm. they're stupid little kids, but they 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 act as that mirror. Same thing is true with animals, right? People talk about how it's so spiritual and bro, sheep are stupid. Like sheep are <laughs> fucking the dumb. There's a reason you call dumb people sheep. Okay. It, sheep are, oh God, they're so fucking dumb. And chickens, these people are like, oh, chickens have personalities. No, you just don't have a personality and you're projecting it on a chicken. Chickens are idiot, idiot, idiot animals. Dogs absolutely have personalities and things. Cows, pigs. Pigs are smart. Pigs yeah. can. Cows are borderline. Kind of depends on the cow. All the cows I've ever had are assholes. Okay. Uh, which makes sense because they're, descend- they're descended from aurochs, <laughs> right? Which were me. But the spiritual level is not from the interaction with the animal itself, right? Maybe other than dogs. Um, the spiritual part comes from the connect. Once you've done enough emotional work, right? Or you're just, some people are just really connected. Like to the world. Mm-hmm. I was, I am now, but I wasn't before. But um, what you understand, raising animals, uh, killing animals, eating animals, 
deeply spirit energetically connects you to the system you are mm-hmm. in. Right? So just yes, no. Last week, we kill the sheep that was born on our land, mm-hmm. never left our land, ate only our grass and our water, was raised with you know our flock, our dogs. We saw it from literally the day it was mm-hmm. born all the way up until we, we slaughtered it. I killed it with my own hands. Like I, I as much as I can, I kill halal style. So I take my knife and I actually cut yeah. its throat, right? Um, we prayed over it, right? Thanked it for its sacrifice, promised to honor it. Um, you know, like I, I'm a big believer in that. There's a reason that every Native American hunting culture does that. I don't think it's an accident, right? Uh, I, th- I like I think there is something to that. It's not necessarily about the animal. It's about the, I mean, if you believe that humans have a soul, that we're energetic beings in a physical experience, I think you do enough psychedelics. Like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, that's obviously true. I think the same thing's true for animals. They're mm-hmm. just at a lower consciousness level than mm-hmm. we are, but they're on the same journey and they're in their energy in the same system. Mm-hmm. And so recognizing that we're all part of the same system and, 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 and care, husbanding them, shepherding them uh, through their lives. Uh, and then uh, taking Making their a conscious, life, a conscious but then choice, a yeah. conscious decision, yeah, yeah. then eating them, honoring them as you eat them, right? This is all stuff that, if you are purely rationalist, yeah. sounds kind of kooky because I think only I think this, none of this is supernatural to me. It's all natural. We just don't intellectually, rationally understand it. Science just has not caught up yet. Mm-hmm. With uh, 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 what the world actually is, just like in 1500, if you were the smartest person, the most educated person on earth in 1700 was wrong about every everything, mm-hmm. wrong about astronomy, about ge- wrong about everything. Why do we think it's that different now? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not wrong about everything, but we're probably wrong about 80 percent, 50 percent. I don't know, some huge amount. And so, like. Um, I, I don't think I would have been like this pre-psychedelic. A lot of this is yeah. the experiences I had on psychedelics where I was like, oh, like it was just like, bro, uh, I my first time I did LSD, I did it with MDMA and it was great. It was an amazing experience. And I, I didn't uh, talk to God, so to speak, but I had the uh, experience of God, right? Of the oneness of all things. And I understood, like I know Buddha's teachings pretty well. I know Jesus Christ's teachings pretty well. Because I covered them in college from an intellectual historical standpoint, right? And on LSD, I was like, oh, like I actually got what they meant. <laughs> like I was like, oh, the kingdom of heaven is within. This isn't now just I for understand. a test. <laughs> but I understand what he meant because yeah. I was so disconnected yeah. from myself. Mm-hmm. And as I connected with myself, I understood what they meant. And, and both of them. And others, Krishna, amazing teachings, Krishnamurti, you go through the list. A lot of, most of the, the great Indian thinkers, um, uh, uh, whether they're Buddhist line or Hindu line, it doesn't matter. And a lot of the great Christians, um, uh, 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 even St. Augustine and people like that. Um, and I was like, oh. And I called up, I got a buddy who's Mormon, Ben Hardy. You know Ben? I know his books. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So he's a good friend of mine. He's very, very Mormon. And, uh, and, and like, uh, um, and I was like, dude. It, like he's, you know, you meet some Christians and you're like, if all Christians were like this, I would be Christian. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like the ones who you've like, not the ones who just say it or whatever, but the ones who kind of live it. Ben's one of those dudes mm-hmm. where he radiates a connection with God. Yeah. Right. And uh, I called him like a week later and I'm like, bro, when you talk about your relationship with God, you're actually talking about an experience. Like you actually have an experience. He's like, yeah, dude, I've been telling you this for 10 years. And I'm like, bro, I thought you were stupid. <laughs> like, I'm like, it didn't, I, when you talk about talking to God or relationship with God or the the experience of God, I'm like, I literally thought you had just allowed religious dogma to mm-hmm. fool you, which a lot of Christians do. They have no connection or relationship with God, but they just believe the dogma. So yeah, they, yeah. that's just it, right? But a, a lot of them actually have a relationship or a connection, like a, a feeling. And he's like, yeah, dude, I've had this since I was a kid. It's why I believe this mm. is because I've had the experience. And I'm like, bro, I'm so sorry. I really just thought you were stupid. I thought you let them fool you. I didn't understand what you meant because I had never had that experience. But now I've had that experience. And I'm not going to go be Mormon 
Cause I don't like, cause that's still dogma, mm -hmm. right? I don't, I think Jesus's main teaching was you can have the experience of God without religion. Mm -hmm. There's a reason he's turning over tables in the mm -hmm. fucking temple and mm -hmm. shit, right? And, and, and fighting the Philistines because he hated priests and there's a reason why. And, but so I don't feel like I need a dog, a dogma to have a relationship with, with God. I just need to open myself to it and feel it. Mm. And I wasn't able to until I had psychedelic. Did I was psychedelic. Say, you said just open yourself, and which is hard. <laughs> it's a big just. Bro, there's some people though who can do it, man. <laughs> like I know a girl who the first time she did MDMA, she's like, "Oh yeah, I've been here before." Like she's just yeah. some of those people. Some yeah. people are just really connected, man. I'm I'm not one of them, uh, but they they are. And so like yeah, it's like it's. I don't talk about how like psychedelics made me believe in God because it wasn't a belief. A belief is yeah. an intellectual thing. I think. Um, and I understand why religion preaches faith, because it, if you don't have the experience, you just have to believe mm -hmm. without evidence. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of historical evidence that uh, most religions began with or use psychedelics as sacrament. Mm -hmm. At the very least, uh, we read a lot of mystics, yeah, and they're yeah, like right. they're clearly. <laughs> I, I mean, I will tell you now, after doing psychedelics, I think that's absolutely unequivocally true. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I'm not going to pretend not, I, I mean, there, look, there, there's a lot of very serious scholars who make the argument that, you know, Jesus used mushrooms in his sacrament and et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I know the accuracy of that or not. I don't know. But I will tell you that my experience with psychedelics, that, uh, I have no doubt that psychedelics are, uh, the tool that most religions use, uh, used. Um, to help you have the experience of God. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's bankrupt about all religions now. I mean, bro, you look at communion in, in, a, in any Christian church. That is someone imitating the experience of God that Jesus had. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just have your own experience? I mean, I mean yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm at the point now where I can, sometimes I can get that connection without medicine. Yeah. Right. Where I, it, it, like especially if I'm if I'm on the ranch, and I'm like doing a, a task that is just very, very life affirming. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be bro. The other day, man, this is gonna sound so fucking kooky. You'll get it. This would have sounded beyond kooky to like thirty year old me. I was um, I was picking up rocks. Yeah, because I live in we live in Texas and everything's wrong. Right, right? Picking up rocks, right, yeah. And, and so, like, you know, one of the ways you regenerate soil is you literally have animals graze and shit, and because the poop builds the hummus in the soil. And so, anyway, so one of my fields is a little rocky, and I was picking up rocks, and then I use the rocks to to do to do things elsewhere. You pick those up, and more grass grows, and you you create this soil cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I was picking up rocks just by myself in the field, and I only have like fifty acres, so it's not that much. Um, picking up rocks, and it was like. I get why why um, primitive or ancient cultures you just talk about like you know God you'd be on a mountain and God like struck I I don't think that, I don't want to say God was talking to me but like I just had this deep feeling of oneness with mm -hmm. the universe right and I'm like and all I was doing was something very trivial to just make the land better you know to to grow more grass for the sheep to make it prettier. Uh, and 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 more to to create a space for more life to sustain more life and then use the rock to actually do something else to sustain more life mm -hmm. and that was it nothing else and the and bro you can hire the poor Mexicans in the uh, parking lot at Home Depot to do mm -hmm. this like it's not a hard task to pick up a rock my four year old does this but it was I don't know man like I had such a deep it can only be explained as a religious experience, or ecstatic yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of those uh, usually doing something like that, right? It, it, you can have them meditating. For me, I tend to have them when I'm really focused on a simple life-affirming task. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is what all the great avatars teach, is that you don't need a religion. You don't even need the medicine. The medicine, you know, uh, psilocybin or whatever, just helps you get there. Mm -hmm. It just makes the, the, the connection easier, right? It's like... Uh, you know, like, it like blazes the path the first time and then it's like, all right, I kind of know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it kind of teaches you yeah. the way. Um, 
but like, I don't know, man. Like that, it's it is kind of funny to be like, uh, uh, I still, <sighs> yeah. It, if what I'm saying to the listeners, if what I'm saying sounds kooky, I don't blame you. Oh no, I, I mean, I would have thought it sounded kooky before, but what the it, it, the thing to take from this is. Have the experience yourself and then see what you get from it, mm-hmm. which is, by the way, exactly what Jesus taught and Buddha too. Yeah. They taught the exact same thing. Buddha will tell you, like, uh, if you see, what do you think Buddha means if you see, meet a Buddha on the road, kill him? Mm-hmm. What he is saying, which I did not really understand until LSD, uh, 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 what he's saying is um, like a Buddha meaning an enlightened person who tells you they know the yeah, way yeah, yeah. and you have to follow them, do what they say. And he doesn't actually mean literally kill them. Yeah. His whole point, because it can be on your own journey, right? His whole point is you 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 can have the experience yourself. They're like That was everything he taught. Mm-hmm. All his frameworks and everything were literally just helping people too stuck in their head to get out of their head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All I was doing. It seems like the, uh, which has been coming up outside of this, but with all of this, it it allows for connection with oneself, head, heart. Once you connect with self, yeah. I don't think there's a difference between connecting with self and connecting with, let's call it source. Sure. A lot of people, like, to me, connecting with God, connecting with the universe, connect, connecting with source are the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. They are all the same thing to me. I use those terms interchangeably. Uh, other people might not. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, uh, look, on a pure, it's so funny, LSD did, did this to me. Because it was like, it was like kind of, it was like the met, the experience was, it was like a teacher standing behind me in a classroom where I could only look forward and someone was like talking to me. That was kind of the experience. And and it was like, I'll never forget it. The, the, the voice or the, it wasn't even a voice. It was just like a presence in my head it was like, look, you already know God uh, is real. You already know all of this. And I'm like, I don't know this. <laughs> And then it was almost like a sigh. And then I was like, okay. All right. And then it started walking me through. Like I was um, like I was the idiot. Uh, not the idiot. I was the asshole who took like O-Kim in college for fun. Like I was like a – I could have been like probably like a a chemist. I mean I was just like a savant at chem and physics. I wasn't savant at physics, but I was good enough at physics. And um, so it literally through what I know about physics and chemistry just started showing me. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. You're exactly right. And like, cause like, like it's all there. We already know it, uh, through the physical universe, like the basic idea, uh, like literally just put up, what's the, the foundational physics discovery of the 20th century e equals MC square energy equals mass mm-hmm. times a constant, right? What all things are energy, mm-hmm. all things. Okay. This is it. Like this is not even a debatable thing in physics. Like mm-hmm. this is, of course, this is energy. These are all. Uh, uh, it literally showed me that. And then second law of thermodynamics, you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> it's like, of, co- of course, God is the system. Mm-hmm. God, we are we are all part of, we are eddies in a stream. Like, and I mean that very literally. We are, you are a piece of energy and I am a piece of energy in a larger energetic system, mm-hmm. right? In fact, there really isn't, this is what Buddha means when he says there is no self, Right. Uh, it means there is no permanent self that stands outside of the system. Mm-hmm. Like an eddy in a stream does exist, but would you say that that's a thing? No, mm-hmm. it's it's the way this the energy moved, the the way the stream moved yeah. for a period of time. It existed, it was there. It's an eddy, but it doesn't exist outside of the stream. That's what Buddha means mm-hmm. when he says there is no I or no self. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what he's talking about. Is that we are uh, a, a, a a a collection of energy assembled in a certain way that stays that way for a certain amount of time, but we don't exist outside of the system. We're all part of the system. And if you understand physics and chemistry, you're like, oh, that's obviously correct. That's 100% exactly correct. There's no way you're arguing with him. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh. And then it was like literally like two hours mm-hmm. of putting me through, like taking what I knew in ke- ke- chemistry and physics. It was, it was so funny. It was like <laughs> this plus this equals, you know, the meme like uh, – like step one, step two, question mark, profit. profit it yeah. was like that, right? It was just like that. And I'm like, oh, of course, obviously. 
And I was like, I felt so stupid because it was all there. Mm. Like it was all already in my head. I, I, even intellectually, I just wasn't making the connection. And then it was like, oh, oh, so I don't like, none of this is supernatural. I didn't have to believe any nonsense. I didn't actually have to take a leap of faith. I just had to both have the, have the experience, be open to the experience, and then just put the pieces together that I already knew. Mm. Yeah. Now the other dimensional stuff, that's a little different, right? Like I've definitely had those experiences, but like, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to, I don't even talk about that. I, even with people who've had them just because I'm like, I don't know what that yeah. means, you know? I mean, I have an idea of what it means. I don't know. I've heard people but, confidently say, well, it's a five dimensional reality. It's a 13 dimensional reality. Well, it's an X or a Y. And it's, I, I, it depends. I, I don't no one, know yet. No one really knows. No one really knows. <laughs> yeah. It's almost certainly true that there are other dimensions. Like mm -hmm. that's like all the CERN stuff that yeah. like, th that's almost certainly true. How many there are, where they exist, do they overlap? Mm. Hmm. Who knows? And yeah, if, if that's what's being connected with through some of these experiences, I'm right. clear. Well, dude, thank you. We're uh, we're winding down. Are you going to do more writing or more of that? Or what is, uh, what's going Man, on with your... The, the God, yeah, of course. The God's honest truth, it, like the thing I keep saying I'm working on, but I'm not really making much progress on is my next book. Like mm -hmm. it's my memoir of how I went from like, like at the end of the, all the Tucker Max books, I kind of retired, right? Yeah. How did I go from that dude to who I am now, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of the story, the in-depth story of all this. Yeah. Um, do you have a tentative title? Yeah. The tentative title is Feelings I Didn't Want to Feel. Okay. Because that's basically how yeah, I did yeah. it. I felt all the feelings I didn't yeah. want to feel. I um, think I, I think this is always what you've been talented at, but I think through telling your story, that could have a really uh, positive right. impact. You're right. I, the God's honest truth is, man, I've probably been stuck on this for, I don't know, man, three years, four years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I make progress in fits and starts. I don't know why I'm stuck. Um, it's not laziness. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe um, there's a chapter that remains to be written at this point. It's a you would think, man. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, clearly, I'm, I'm only 48, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I have a feeling that the thing, I'm, the thing or things I'm going to be no, most known for, I haven't done yet. It might just be this book, right? Mm -hmm. Or it might be something else. Um, uh, I, I have a feeling kind of like the last 10 years for me have been like a like a monkish repertory yeah. prep sort of like phase for the next level. I, I don't know what that is. We'll see. Mm. I, I don't know, man. I, one of the things I've learned to do is uh, I'm a huge, there's a book called trust, R surrender, receive. That's about MDMA. And I've really learned to kind of like to essentially be that this is what Jesus means when he says, trust in God. He doesn't mean submit to someone in charge. What Jesus really means is like, because when you combine that kingdom of heaven is within all that stuff, mm -hmm. what he means is um, there, you're part of a universal, universal system, an energetic system, right? If you want to call it God, that makes total sense. You're part of God, right? God is, uh, uh, and um, there is a plan and there is a plan, maybe isn't the right word. There is, um, it is in motion mm -hmm. and things are going. And it might not look like it, yeah. Right. And, 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 and trust in it just means like, yeah, of course you can make decisions. You can do things. I think that's actually part of, of what our existence is about is, is making decisions, learning from them, elevating our consciousness. That kind of, I think that's literally the point of life, but, but trust in God doesn't mean uh, submit to a higher authority, like submit, like just do what they're told. You're not, it's not be a slave. It's not just be a follower. And it's not like, nothing you do matters. What it means is both like there is a system that's going and you are part of it and it has its own logic and its own direction and its own, that's well outside of you. In fact, it's all inside of you. You're part of it. And so understand that while at the same time, uh, you, you have some agency in mm -hmm. that system, mm -hmm. right? Like you can make decisions and you can impact the system, right? You can't change the system in the sense that like, I'm going to take this from an energetic system to something else, right? Yeah. Or we're going to go from carbon to silicon-based life forms. No, no, no. But you can absolutely impact it, mm -hmm. right? Um, that to me is is not one of his prime teachings, but one of the the sort of things that 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 both Jesus and Buddha taught in very very different ways. That one specifically. But um, I'm a big believer in kind of surrendering to a higher power mm -hmm. in that understanding exists and I'm part of it, um, and, and not trying to like 
force yeah. my vision on my life, mm -hmm. but kind of accept what is happening while at the same time seeing the places where I can really, yeah. I get to make my own decisions and I can really impact that and, and go with it, you know? Yeah, like, cause yeah. like it's a, it's a paradox. No, it's I, not I'm, one I'm or the other. Most people well. think it's either one or the other. I don't, I think it's both. You know, almost all, all true great truths are paradox, mm -hmm. you know, that we are, and essentially, you know, uh, uh, an eddy in a current, but we also have some agency in that current yeah. as that eddy in that current. Yeah. You know? It sounds like, and I'm wrestling like, uh, tr developing a discernment of intuition versus like, am I just being lazy versus is this an intuitive knowing that like, look, this it's not time to write this book. <laughs> I, bro, uh, so, okay. That's oh, such a good point, dude. Such a good point. Uh, I struggle with that too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still, I don't feel like I'm, but I, I mean, I, I definitely know I have good friends who with like far less psychedelic work than I did, like are just deeply connected yeah. to source now. And they're yeah. just like going. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I'm not mad at them. I'm like, man, fuck, I, <laughs> um, I still struggle sometimes wondering how, like, 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 am, like, is that me? Is that my ego? Mm -hmm. What am I? And then uh, 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 kind of unpacking all that. I will tell you one of the things that I've learned to do is pay attention to what a lot of people call synchronicities yeah, or yeah. signs. Like I pay attention to those, mm. right? So like, unless it's fourteen people calling you to start a psychedelic business, and you go, Guys, right. shut up." If like if I get a ton of <laughs> random people asking me for a specific yeah, yeah. thing, that means something, yeah, right. Um, it, it, so like like a buddy of mine, he's thinking about starting this thing, and it has a, 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 a like a, a heavy wolf component to it, like mm -hmm. which without going into details, the wolf symbolism and what he wants to start is very heavy, and he's been very much on the fence. He kind of knows he needs to do it, doesn't want to do it. Bro, he was camping the other day mm. and a pitch black fucking wolf. He was hiking a pitch black, black a wolf, like a mm. fucking timber wolf, solid black, standing in the trail, staring at him. Mm. Do you know how rare it is for a wolf, for, for, for a wolf to have a mm -hmm. contact with human is extremely rare. Mm. A solid colored wolf mm. of any color is like, like 1% of wolves. And he was like, Bro, do you think that's a sign? Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, that's the signiest yeah, sign yeah. of all signs. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, you're thinking of starting a wolf thing, and there was a wolf thing, like a black one too. I'm like, because he did like a mock logo and it was a black wolf. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, yeah, you're yeah. fucking killing me. Like, uh, uh, uh. so like that's that's a an extreme example, mm -hmm. but I definitely try and pay attention to stuff like that if I'm uncertain or unsure. And either way, you know. Yeah. Like, and how it, how it hits you. Cause you, even he kind of knows like, dude, slow down, stop asking me, yeah. how do you feel about it? Yeah. And it's like, w push away the, what you're supposed to do or the fear of what you can't do. It's like, how does, does what that, do you think? does that strike you somewhere on the inside? And it's like, come on, man. And you know, that's resonant. A wolf standing in front of you on yeah. the trail, man. Yeah. Like you gotta be really disconnected. And you're not, not telling me this I, so that I can give you the permission slip. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This, this might mean something. Yeah. Do you think? Oh man. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, we're running down on uh, on time now, so we got to wrap. But thank you so much, man. Of course, man. It's been wonderful. My pleasure. Yeah. Beautiful. Peace out, yeah. everybody.